What's up, this is Mr. G here, and you may be wondering why I'm wearing this ridiculous get up. Well, uh, as my students told me, it's not a good look, so I'm gonna take it off a minute here. But I'm pretty excited because these are the first things I've printed out using our 3D printer that we got back there. Um, yeah, my classroom has decided to join the nation of makers and become makers ourselves, part of the maker nerd, maker geek, 3D printing evolution, revolution that's going on here. And it's not exactly a new concept for me, the idea of 3D printing. I was exposed to it 15 years ago when I was a student volunteer in college at SIGGRAPH, which is a big uh, computer graphics conference. It was in LA, SIGGRAPH 1999. And uh, I worked in the media lab. That's what I volunteered to do, just so I could play with the cool toys and see them in action. Um, and they had some 3D scanners there, which scanned my head into a large uh, multi-polygon file. and. Um, it was big enough, so big I had to save it on a zip drive that tells you about how ancient the history it was. And here's what it looks like. There's me when I was young, tw about 20 years old, maybe 21, I don't remember exactly. Um, but pretty cool. I was able to scan it as, it just scanned my head in about one minute. So that was pretty amazing that this technology existed even 15 years ago. Thing is, those devices were tens of thousands of dollars to do that. Uh, and that's what's making a revolution now is that you know, just like computers from the 60s and 70s were huge and took a lot of money and then the, the personal computer revolution really changed things when they became affordable enough and portable enough to fit in the home. That's what's going on with the 3D printers now, the, the rapid prototyping machines. Um, and why I'm bringing it into the classroom is because, number one, it's really getting the kids excited about the way things are going and realizing that the way we fabricate and create is changing and that we can change with the times um, and use whatever modern methods and materials are available, just like what we're learning about in social studies this year. If you look up there, you might see where we started from. Hand-blown, hand prints uh, of, of ink, pigment, and charcoal, just like the cavemen did. So we started with that, and we're moving to the modern era through history in our social studies units. So it's great to show how modern tools are used. It also kind of drives a point home of you know, why are we building things with popsicle sticks, with sugar cubes in school? I don't know anybody who's a professional uh, sugar cube model maker. If you are one, let me know and I'll be sure to maybe Skype with you and you can show off some of your work for my students. But I don't know anybody who builds uh, models out of sugar cubes and popsicle sticks and toothpicks for a living. I do know people who do this kind of thing for a living, designing CAD models, uh, industrial designers. Um, people who have to create prototypes and models for the things they're inventing. So that's what I want to get the kids exposed to, is things that are relevant and real and practical. Uh, here's something that we created last year. Uh, it's a scale model, exact scale to the measurements of the Parthenon. We were studying uh, ancient Greece, and this was a way to bring in the social studies standards and integrate them with STEM skills, technology, uh, mathematics, and engineering. And so the students use free SketchUp software, which uh, it works on Mac or PC computers, and they built this model with the help of some tutorials I made for them, and they had to do a lot of math for the dimensions and stuff. I promised them that if we were able to finish the model completely, I'd print one out, I'd take the best one that somebody made and print it out for the whole class and put it on display. So I did. But um, to do that, I did not have access to a 3D printer, so I went over to the high school we have here nearby and worked with the CAD and woodworking teacher there. To, um, to use his MakerBot printer, MakerBot replicator, and we printed this out, and it came out pretty nice. So this year I was thinking, I really want to do this some more. The kids were so excited about it. It was relevant to them, and it gave them real-world sk skills while building upon the standards we were working on. So right now my students are um, building a 3D model of the Ziggurat of Ur um, in Mesopotamia. Uh, I plan on also doing the Great Pyramids. So I want to go through our history and look at, really investigate the architecture and the monuments and the building structures that they used using modern building structures and, and planning tools. And I think that's really going to be a useful, worthwhile thing, and the kids are loving it. Um, but I needed to get a 3D printer. And what criteria did I use? Well, one, like I said, had to be affordable. MakerBot, even though I used it at the high school last year to print this 3D uh, Parthenon, and it worked pretty well, and it has good software. I trust it, but it's too expensive. They keep raising the price on the MakerBot. Every time they come out with a new model, it's more expensive. These things should be getting less expensive as time goes on, but the new replicator is almost $3,000. So that made it a no-go. They do have a smaller model, the Mini, and I looked at that, and it's $1,300 to $1,400 still. Still over 1000 bucks, kind of pricey for my wallet. But also, the bigger problem is it has a very small print envelope, 4.9 inches square. 
That means these glasses would not be even printable on that thing. I didn't want to limit the creativity or problem solving capabilities of my students in our invention hour where we're spending an hour a week learning an authentic invention process of identifying a problem, creating solutions, whether they're physical, mechanical, or device solutions to a problem, or something virtual like um, coding an app. Either way, I want this to be authentic and not to limit my students in what they can create. And if you're talking about something that's only four inches, you get something about that big as the large as you can go. Okay, so MakerBot Mini was out of the question as well. Obviously, a very high criteria is the quality of the prints. I wanted to get something that had reasonably good quality. Not clunky, not goopy, uh, not prone to having a lot of problems in the prints. Holes or gaps or globs of, of material that hang out the side. We need the prints to be functional. Maybe not perfect, they don't have to be very, very high resolution, but good enough. And speaking of quality, I just wanted the machine to be fairly easy to use. You can get very inexpensive machines, 300 bucks even, but they're kits and you gotta put them together, you gotta do troubleshooting, calibration, configuration, tinkering and tweaking and, and you know modifying it. And I don't have the time for that. So I really wanted something as plug and play as possible with minimal maintenance, effort, calibration, and setup. Um, I did want a heated print bed because I've heard that that can really help prevent things like lifting and warping. If you look on this in the front edge of it, you'll see it's not completely flat. And that's because the, the cold print bed or cold air can cause it to shrink as it cools too quickly. And that's a problem and it can cause jam ups, it can affect print quality. So I wanted to get one with the heated print bed and a lot of them have that now. Uh, another concern was that a lot of them are tethered to a computer with a USB cable. And if anything happens to that USB cable, if it gets bumped, if it gets jostled, if it falls out, if it loses connection, your print's kaput and you gotta restart the print. That's a waste of materials and even worse, it's a waste of time. This, this robot print going behind me is the longest one I've tried. It's an eight hour print job according to the estimate in matter control. Some of the prints, these glasses were about an hour, um, almost two hours when you include the earpieces. You don't want to lose that time because the cable got jostled. So some printers have SD card slots where you can insert SD cards containing the models and it can print right off of that, um, including this one back here. Some of them even have Wi-Fi capabilities. So that was a consideration I had. Uh, I was preferably looking for an enclosed model. And if you look carefully, you can see this is not actually fully enclosed. The enclosed printers uh, supposedly have the benefit of having climate control because of that enclosure, so you don't have to worry about cold air affecting things, especially for ABS. But speaking of ABS, they can cause toxic fumes and other problems. They're not as good for the environment, especially not as good for the classroom, for student health and safety. Uh, they have to melt at a higher temperature. So I really wanted to stick to PLA only, um, or have a device that's versatile enough to do them both. But PLA is the main goal here. and. Uh, those are the biggest criteria. And then the print size, of course. I need something big enough to allow my students full freedom of creativity, expression, and problem solving abilities. I want that flexibility even if I don't use it. It's just nice to know it's there if we need it. So um, that led me to, to narrow it down to several devices. The MakerBot was the first one I looked at and ruled it out very quickly because they've raised the price to ridiculous levels. Um, another one I looked at, which is pretty new, is called the Cubify Cube. And it looks very nice. It's aesthetically pleasing. Um, and it sounds like it's trying to be plug and play. It's pretty user friendly sounding. It has its own proprietary software that looks very easy to use. And it, the nice thing about it is it works over Wi-Fi. It even has tablet apps that can connect to it. So it looks pretty simple and straightforward and it's supposed to be kid friendly. It's enclosed. It's safe. Uh, the problems with it are it's only a five and a half inch print envelope cubed. So still pretty small model size. And a bigger problem is it requires proprietary cartridges that the company makes themselves. Now, those cartridges cost five times as much as getting a spool of PLA from some generic source or from a, a different brand or a different company. With devices, with some printers, you can just buy spools from anywhere you want and use them across different devices. Some require proprietary cartridges. Then you have to worry about what if the cartridge is not available? What if they go out of business or change the model? What if they start hiking the price and you're stuck with it because it doesn't even let you use other brands or generic materials? So I didn't want to be saddled with spending five times as much for the materials than I needed to spend. Unfortunately, that ruled out the cube, both for the print size and for the cartridges. Another device I considered is the Affinia. Now, the Affinia 3D is... Uh, 
has gotten really good reviews as far as its print quality. And I looked at some of the print samples online and some of the videos, and it looks great as far as what it can create. Um, unfortunately, it is, it's an open exposed system. Uh, it's not enclosed. It is a small print size, again, only about six inches cubed that it can print out. So a little bit larger than some, but still not that big. It's the same price as the MakerBot Mini at about 1350, 1300 or so. Um, so these things are all sort of detrimental and it's designed primarily to work with ABS. It's not customized for PLA. I also considered the printer bot. Now the printer bot is one of the first ones I looked at because it's, it's the least expensive that I could find basically. You can buy a kit for $300 or $400 and then if you want a fully assembled one including a heated print bed, it's more like 500 or 600 bucks. Um, it has a big following, a, a big uh, culture online for that one. But from what I understand, it does take a lot more hands-on tinkering, calibration, setup, and maintenance than some of the others do. And that kind of worried me a little bit. I've heard good things about it. The print quality seemed okay. It's just the maintenance setup and, um, and that whole management feature that I wasn't thrilled about. Also, the print size is fairly small. I think it gets six inches cubed in that one uh, for the price tag of like $600. And it's not in an enclosed case. So eventually, I really narrowed it down to two different models, and they happen to be two of the least expensive and largest print size models that are out there. Um, one was a Solid Doodle 3D, and this was a very tempting model. It's a lot like the printer bot. It's sort of a bare bones, very basic machine, um, but it is enclosed in a case with a nice you know, see-through glass pane in the front, which is kind of a nice feature. It does have the heated print bed, and it has a large print envelope at 8 inches cubed for the newest version, uh, which I believe is Solid Doodle 4. So I was very tempted to get this at a price tag of $599, and I found out that with educational pricing, it's actually even better. It's $550, bucks, including two spools of PLA filament, which normally runs $35 to $40 bucks a spool. So that's a pretty great deal. It was very tempting. Um, some of the drawbacks of the Solid Doodle, though, which made me a little wary of it, were that I saw a few things online that showed less than stellar print quality on some models that people were printing out as well as some mechanical and technical issues that people were having with it didn't seem uh, entirely plug and play you had to do a lot of calibration with it and tweak some tweaking and it doesn't have uh, any onboard or Wi-Fi printing you there's no SD card capability or Wi-Fi capability so you're limited to tethering it to a computer with a USB cable so if the USB cable gets disconnected somehow you've just lost your entire print so that was a little bit of a concern in a classroom of sixth graders where the room might shake a little bit with the kids walking around it might get bumped or jostled and suddenly the cable pops out and we're out of print so I ended up going with this model back here which is the Robo 3D printer um, it's still pretty inexpensive this one was $720 from B&H photo video why did I choose this one well it has the largest print size out of all of them for one thing it's a 10 inch by 9 inch by 8 inch print envelope that it can handle basically that entire open space you can see there and it is an open space it's not in an enclosed case that's really the only drawback that I've seen to it so far the print quality is 100 microns which is on par with the MakerBot and I can attest that it's pretty good quality if you want to see actual prints and how it works you can watch my next video which is just gonna be a review of the Robo 3D um, but I have to say that the best thing about it is that it basically was plug-and-play I took it out of the box plugged in the USB cable which by the way you don't have to keep it plugged in because there's an SD card slot on this one and then I ran through the matter control software which is already pre-configured for specifically for the Robo 3D and comes with 20 pre-made models such as this bow tie here so anyway we're just excited to uh, to join this this maker revolution and most I'm excited because I really want the kids to learn about problem solving that's the whole reason I'm a teacher whether I'm teaching math or reading or writing or computers technology old school whatever it is it's so that the kids can learn how to solve problems in life that's really the bottom line so that they can learn how to survive learn how to innovate and uh, and have a good life basically that's why we invent that's why we create and that's why we solve problems and this is just one of those tools that can help us do it